Did you know that ticket prices can actually go down right before the game? That's where game time comes in. Game time tracks ticket prices in real time from thousands of trusted sellers, then shows you all the best deals. So we can get tickets at the last minute for up to 60% off. Download game time now. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome into NFL Daily on this Wednesday. February 14th, which means it's Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day to everybody out there. Cam Rogers alongside Harris Rubenstein. We got a jam-packed show mm -hmm. for you as the NFL offseason is in full swing. We are ranking the offensive line for the free agency pool. We are also ranking the top 15 mm -hmm. wide receivers in the free agency market, as well as tight ends too, Harris. So a lot to get to. Oh, and of course, the NFL rumors. Of course, got to gotta get through the uh, news and rumors. But hey, ha happy Valentine's Day to you, Cam. Hey, I appreciate that. There you go. I'll be alone tonight and you <laughs> won't, but that's okay. <laughs> Let's get into the rankings, ladies and gentlemen. We'll start things off with the offensive line. And we'll count you down, by the way. So as we go through these names, of course, they will get better in quality, talent, etc. Mm -hmm. Although they're all talented. But let's get into number 10 in terms of free agent offensive linemen, Cameron Fleming. Offensive tackle for the New England Patriots as the host of the Patriots of Port Harris. Mm -hmm. You know him very well. I do, and he's actually been a really good player for them. At least he was this year. He started about uh, six games this year for the Patriots. Once Marcus Cannon went down, he was splitting time with Adrian Waddle. But he won the battle, and to be totally honest, he, would, he was great in the Super Bowl. He was great throughout the entire playoffs. He did give up that one pass rush, you know, with Brandon Graham and Chris yep. Long. That ended up causing the fumble, but... Look, he's only 25. He's gotten better every single year in the NFL. The Patriots have used him as a, a third tackle, kind of a swing tackle, especially on run on rundowns. He's been really good for them. I think the Patriots will probably bring him back, maybe install him as the full-time left tackle if they need to. But if a team wants to bring him in as a start and really pay him, I wouldn't be surprised if he if he ended up leaving the Patriots. He got a couple teams interested, maybe the Bucs, the Giants especially. They're probably interested in every offensive lineman that comes out this year. But Definitely the Bengals too. I, exactly. I think Cameron Fleming would be a good, a good young option for any team, but I would expect the Patriots to try to bring him back. He, he, he's a good fill-in starter slash low-end right tackle if you need one. Number one offensive tackle in pass blocking efficiency among the free agents out mm -hmm. there. So, of course, a smaller sample size, only 191 pass block snaps compared to, for example, Nate Solder's 620. And, and you know, I, I don't, you always want to pump coaches, but Dante Skarniecki, the Patriots offensive line coach, if there is going to be, like, one guy that you can point to say, wow, he's done so well with him, it's Marcus Cannon, who's now the starting right tackle, Cameron Fleming. They got Cameron Fleming in the sixth round out of Stanford, a total project, incredibly raw, and over the course of about four to five years, he's turned Cameron Fleming into a starting caliber right tackle. It's been really impressive to watch his Only growth. Only 25 years young. Exactly. Too. It's been really impressive to watch his growth. And also, go listen to what David Shaw has to say about him. Got, got a lot of great things to say about this guy. All right, so there's Cameron Fleming at number 10 in our offensive line rankings for free agents, a 2017 pro football focus grade of 75.8 might I add so there he is at number 10 let's get into the single digits now and to the guard position we go Joe Berger of the Minnesota Vikings and the Minnesota Vikings offensive line collectively Nick Easton and Berger as well really exceeded expectations They're pretty darn solid in pass protection this past year kind of all came undone in that NFC Championship game in case Keenum really struggled. But Berger checks in at number nine, a quality pass protector. The, the real question here is he's set to turn 36 in May, Harris, so no long-term answer here. Yeah, not a long-term answer. He's also been kind of a journeyman in his career. He's played for the Panthers, the Dolphins, the Cowboys, and the Vikings, and the Dolphins a second time. He beat out uh, John Sullivan last year for the starting job this year. Moved him over to guard. Look, he's a solid option. Like you said, he is 36, though. He is getting a little bit worse. He had his best year in 2015, but I think he'd be a good fill-in option or a low-end starter if you need someone at guard. He's not going to be one of the best offensive linemen in football, but he's going to be a solid starter for you. He's not going to destroy your O-line. He can fill in really well next to whoever you need him to. Again, someone like the Giants should look into. I think the Seahawks would also be a good fit for him just because they need cheaper options in the offensive line. They don't pay a lot of money for offensive linemen. I think Joe Berger would be a good option for them. Kind of matches everything they're looking I for. I think he'd actually be a very nice option for Seattle. They're in a mm -hmm. really difficult salary cap situation yeah. here. And so they can't go for the Andrew Norwells of the world who are going to be demanding big-time yeah. money. So 
There you go. And I would also expect the Vikings to try to get younger along the offensive line. They do have a lot of age and a lot of money already on the O-line. Don't be surprised if they try to grab a starting caliber guard and maybe the second or third round to try to fill in a slot. You know, look, you need those young guys all over your uh, all over the team simply for contract reasons a lot of the time, and I think they're going to go a little bit younger on the O-line. He was a premier run blocker way yeah. back in 2015, but he has declined steadily since then, and that's mm -hmm. expected set to turn 36 in May. So yeah. there is Joe Berger at number nine in our rankings here. Let's check in with number eight. We will stay with the guard position. One Josh Klein of the Tennessee Titans. Not the greatest run blocker in the world, Harris, but in terms of pass protection, he was solid. It's kind of crazy for me to see him on this list because he was on the Patriots for about three years and he, he was just terrible. Like so terrible, he became a meme among Patriots fans for being so bad. Then he goes to Tennessee, gets with Mike Malarkey and ends up becoming a decent guard. Not great, but good enough to be able to you know stay on an offensive line and start for the entire season had a great year this year especially pa pass protection only two sacks or qb hits in 2017 but like you said he's a really bad run blocker and i think that for the titans what they look to do on offense they should be looking to replace him they need guys on the offensive line that can run block because they're a run first offense so they're probably going to be going forward I, I'm not a huge Josh Klein fan. I literally cannot get the memories out of my head about how bad he was with the Pats. But again, another low-end guard starter. If you need him to fill in during pass downs, then sure, he can come in and do really well for you. But I don't think it's a consistent option over the course of a season. He's going to be your best option. But again, we talk about cheap options, a guard, the Seahawks look for guys like that. I think that the Dolphins being on this list is also really, really good. They need someone, another low-end option that can slot maybe next to, you know, uh, well, Juwan James, they do end up bringing him back or, you know, just uh, may maybe a Laramie Tunsil if they yep. decide to keep him at tackle. So Josh Klein would be a decent option, but... Uh, again, I, I might be the wrong person talking about Josh Klein. I can't take, I can't get those memories out of my head. Well, he did have a 97.4 pass blocking efficiency mm -hmm. rating, which was 15th best among guards. But you know, I'm kind of on you, on you, Harris. At six three, he's a little undersized for my liking. Maybe he kind of played beyond expectations and was probably more of a product of yeah. a generally good offensive line for the Titans last year. So exactly. there is Josh Klein checking in at number eight. Let's transition now into number seven now. As we head inside to the center position, John Sullivan of the Rams played pretty darn well in the 13th best pass protecting center this season. A pro football focus grade of 74.6, which is pretty good considering his overall career, but he is 32. I don't know if this is just a personal thing. I feel like John Sullivan's one of the more name offensive linemen in the NFL. I feel like, like the, uh, not the average fan, but I feel like deeper NFL fans know who John Sullivan is. He's just been around for so long. He was on the Vikings for such a long time. Like, John Sullivan's a really good, a really good center if you need to slot someone in. And again, it's hard to find good centers in the NFL. We were talking about this before with the with the San Francisco 49ers bringing back Daniel Kilgore, their center. Huge, yep. Look, centers are tough to come by, especially good ones that are going to be consistent over the course of an entire season. John Sullivan's not going to blow you away. We have a 75 overall pro football focus grade, but 927 snaps. Look. You're not going to find that right off the street for any sort of center. I think he's good enough to fill in and start for a team. I think the Bengals would be a good option. They need some veteran leadership on that offensive line. Just get him onto a team to slot him at center and leave him alone. Just let him do his thing. He's not going to be perfect, but at the same time, he's not going to kill you. He's good enough to start. So John Sullivan is at number seven in our free agent offensive lineman rankings. Let's go to number six now. We'll stay at center. Weston Richburg of the Giants. He's really good when he's healthy. Yes. But the key word is when. He did have some injuries last he, season. He did have some injuries last season. But if you remember in 2016, he was one of the best overall offensive linemen in football. But no one talked about it because the rest of the Giants offensive line was so terrible. But right. Wesson Richburg is really, really good when he's healthy. I think he's going to get pretty underpaid this offseason by a team who's going to say, hey, you're injured. You know, we can't really pay you top dollar. He should be getting paid top dollar. But that injury really took out a lot of his season. But, like... I think he's going to end up back with the Giants. They cannot afford to lose him in the center of that offensive line. They need him to be healthy. They drafted him in the second round for a reason. He's a fantastic center. He has repertoire with Eli Manning. So I think they'll end up keeping him. But any team that ends up getting him, if they play a full, if he plays a full season for them, that's a steal, especially at the price that he's going to end up getting paid. 
has only allowed four sacks in his four-year career. So Weston Richburg there at number six as we get to the top five here. Harris, one more point. Yeah, one more thing. Got to watch out. He has had concussion problems in his career. And at the center position, concussion problems are not something you want to look at. Ruined Dan Connolly's career for the Patriots has ruined tons and tons of offensive linemen in the past. So watch out for those concussion problems. All right, so let's do it. Get inside the top five. Let's take a look at offensive tackle Nate Solder. So we talked about Fleming yep. on one side. Let's go to the other side for the Patriots and Solder. He's been one of the best run blocking tackles in the NFL for a long time now, but pass coverage has always been, or, or pass blocking, I should say, has always been a weird mystery for Nate he's Solder. He's a little soft. He is a little soft. Sometimes he's really, really good, and sometimes he's really, really bad. Sometimes it doesn't look like he's completely focused on what's going on. So he's an interesting option for any team. I personally don't think the Patriots could end up bringing him back. They kind of drafted his replacement last year in Antonio Garcia out of Troy. I think he's going to get priced out. I think the Colts would actually be a good option. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets signed and maybe moved to right tackle. I'd be a little wary about making him your franchise left tackle. I think that if you look at his career, he's so unbelievably inconsistent. One year he'll be terrible. The next year he'll be fantastic. Next year he'll be awful again. And then you'll have a year like he had in 2016 where they uh, won the Super Bowl uh, against the Falcons. And, they were, and he was fantastic again. And then this year, he's horrible. So you never really know what you're going to get at Nate Solder. That's been his entire career. I, I wouldn't be surprised if the Patriots let him go. I think he's still going to get good top money. Look, it's tough to find a lot of tackles in the NFL who have been starting for as long as he has and has experience in Super Bowls. So I think Nate Solder will end up getting picked up, maybe a little bit overpaid, like we saw Matt Khalil get overpaid last year. But I, I would be surprised if the Patriots bring him back. Ranked tied for 56, Harris, in terms of pass blocking efficiency among yeah. tackles with 178 plus pa pa pass blocking snaps last season. So, you know, I mean, it, it, he's getting the reps, but he's not doing a good job with those reps. Patriots fans have wanted him out for years because you never really know when he's going to explode. That's the thing with tackles, unless you're like a Joe Thomas, is that if you're playing really, really well, a lot of the times you won't get a lot of heat from fans or you won't really get a lot of attention. But when you're playing bad, it's noticeable. I think Nate Solder was really exploited in a lot of games this year. So there he is at number five. Let's take a look at number four now, staying at the tackle position. This time we go to right tackle with Jawan James. He did get hurt back in 2017, but he's still a young guy. Will be 26 in June and one of the better pass protectors out there. I think he actually will be highly coveted in the free agency market, mm -hmm. Harris. Yeah, and the former first-round pick, former uh, all-rookie team for Pro Football Writers of America when he came out. He's a really good player when he's healthy. It's just a matter of when is he going to be consistently healthy. He's played 40 games in, in his four-year career so far. So, look, him only being 26, and you're able to pick him up off the free agent market, that's an incredible pickup at, at his age. But, again, I think he's going to end up getting very overplayed, but I think he's going to end up getting plucked away from Miami. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to overpay this guy in order to get a stalwart right tackle. I'm thinking that Texans might. Texans would be a really good option for him. I'd also be surprised if, if Denver tries to go that direction, but obviously they have a lot of other things to deal with, with the two wide receivers and we'll the get corners there and Denver. the quarterbacks. So, We'll see what happens with Juwan James, but again, he's a former first-round pick. He has played at times like that former first-round pick, and when he plays that well, he's one of the best right tackles in football. But it's all a matter of when is he going to stay on the field. All right, so Juwan James has dealt with his fair share of injuries. So has this guy, checking in at number three, Jack Muhort, guard slash little bit of tackle as well for the Indianapolis Colts. Just one of the many injuries on that front line, by the way. Ryan Kelly got hurt as well, and so it really kind of unraveled for Indianapolis last season. And, you know, Muhort, outside of last year, is actually a pretty quality lineman. He, he is a good lineman, and he, it, it's, it's tough with him because he's also very versatile, but at the same time, I, I think he's pretty inconsistent. He's a good pass protector. I don't think he's fantastic in the run game just you have to be wary when signing him that you could get a really good player at times but he's also going to miss time I'm I would be nervous about picking him up I think he ends up staying with the Colts I don't know how much money he's going to get on the open market I think he'll end up getting picked up again and given a decent contract by the Colts former second round pick same draft actually as Juwan James in 2014 mm. he was really really good in college he's been good in the NFL but hasn't been quite good to get that crazy amount of money on the free agent market like we've seen some other offensive linemen get. I think Indianapolis is the place for him. All right, so there is Jack Muhort at number three. So let's take a look at number two now, and we're really getting into the quality players. Justin Pugh, guard. Now, he faced his fair share of injuries last year, actually earned 
a poor pro football focus grade. But again, health. He's pretty darn good when it's, when it's there. I, I blame the Giants for how weird of a career he's had, and I blame them mostly because they keep playing him at tackle. He's not a good tackle. But he's a fantastic guard. He's a great, great guard, but whenever they switch him out to tackle, he would struggle because he's not a tackle. If you keep him at guard and you sign him and you just keep him there, he's going to end up being one, I think, at least one of the 10 best guards in football. Only 27. Just don't put him at tackle for whatever reason. Well, not for whatever reason. The Giants just could never stay healthy or find a working – uh, offensive line combination, but when he was at guard, he was one of the best guards in all of football. I have a lot of Giants fans, uh, Giants fans who, uh, who are friends of mine, all they talk about is how aggravated they were whenever McAdoo would put him at right tackle, and he would just struggle. He would get blown off the ball in pass coverage. He couldn't do anything in the run game, but you put him at guard, you let him pull, you let him pick, and he does fantastic stuff. I think whatever team picks him up, put him at guard and don't move him. I'm, I'm sick of him moving around. All right, so you see the teams likely interested, the Jaguars, they need help on that line. You have the Colts as well, Miami Dolphins too. So Justin Pugh at number two. So our most prized free agent offensive lineman is one Andrew Norwell, somebody I have talked about many of times on my shows in the mornings. And look, this guy is fantastic. He's going to be the... Highly coveted offensive lineman and free agency, and he's going to get paid big time. Yeah, he's going to get paid big time. It will be really interesting to see where he ends up because, as you talked about on your show, the Panthers don't have a lot of money to pay him with. So where is he going to end up going? I would love to see him get picked up by the 49ers. Just have that consistent uh, road grader, excuse me, in the middle of that offensive line. Have him protect Jimmy G for a long time. He's still decently young. He still has a lot of football left to play. He's great in pass coverage, great in the run, was a first-team All-Pro this year as well. I think he'd be a perfect guy to sit next to, uh, next to Kilgore, who they just signed to an extension today, like we mentioned before. He's going to be a great pickup for whatever team, but watch out. He's going to be coveted by a lot of teams looking to shore up their offensive line. You know, We have the Colts listed there, 49ers, Texans, Jets as well. So. Andrew Norwell probably going to get the biggest contract of any offensive lineman this offseason. Wouldn't be surprised if he heads out west. I wouldn't be surprised if he's the most paid or highest paid guard out there after the new league year is all said and done and everybody has signed with their new team. So Andrew Norwell is our top offensive lineman among free agents. Let's summarize our list here. 10 through 6, Cameron Fleming, Joe Berger, Josh Klein, John Sullivan, and Weston Richburg. And then the top five, Nate Solder, Jawan James, Jack Muhort, Justin Pugh, and Andrew Norwell. This is NFL Daily here on Chat Sports Facebook Live. Cam Rogers alongside Harris Rubenstein. We are presented by the Game Time app. Get up to 60% off all those last minute sports tickets, concert tickets, and so much more. Chatsports.com slash tickets is the way to download the app. Harris, you're a big fan, my friend. I'm a big fan. I've been using this app for, for at least four to five years now. I used it back when I was going to college in Boston. I know a bunch of people in the office have used them as well. It, it, it's just so efficient. It, it's so cheap. Use the game time app. Like just take all the trouble out of buying tickets. It, it's just so simple. Great for last minute decisions too. Absolutely. Right. You know, you're thinking of something to do that night. Hey, head on to the game time app and see what's going on around you. All right, folks. So we talked about the offensive linemen. Now we are ranking free agent wide receivers. So let's get into it. We're doing the top 15. So we will start off with number 15 on our list. And Harris Rubenstein, it is yeah. one Terrell Pryor. Oh, God, Terrell Pryor. Uh, see, do you know why it pains me to see this? Because I was telling everyone to draft him fantasy this year. I thought he was due for a massive, massive season, and I was totally wrong. It turns out that he was only good because he was on the Browns, and the volume was just absolutely crazy for him. 20 catches for 240 yards and a touchdown with the money that they gave him. This was a prove-it year for him, and he just totally did not prove it. But I will say this. I think if he goes to another team and gets another chance, he's going to have a better year next year. He's still one of the most freakish athletes you'll ever watch. If you go watch his high school tape coming out, he's just he's a freak. He's an absolute monster athletically. It's just It just didn't work out this year in Washington. I think he'll end up leaving. I think the Ravens or even him going back to the Browns would be a great option. Can you imagine the Browns offense next year, him at the number two slot or the number three wide receiver spot next to Josh Gordon? I think it could end up working, but look, this was supposed to be a big prove year for him. He was supposed to get paid after this season, and he just totally flopped. So, you know, buy at your own risk. 
So Terrell Pryor, yeah, he probably made a lot of fantasy owners out there pretty me. angry. He made me very unhappy. Yeah, and he just never got on the same page with Kirk Cousins and everything like that. So we'll see where he ends up. He's at number 15. Let's check in with number 14. We will stay with the Washington Redskins and take a look at one Ryan Grant. So the Excuse Redskins me. now with a new quarterback in Alex Smith. Do you think Ryan Grant will stay with Washington? Sneeze uh, uh, alicious there. <laughs> He's delicious. Well, I'm glad that we're talking about Ryan Grant, the wide receiver, and not Ryan Grant, the old Packers running back. But look, Ryan Grant's a really solid option. If you look at his statistics, he ended up getting the production I think people thought Terrell Pryor was going to get. So interesting that we have them back to back. He's a really solid option. He's 27 years old, kind of looking for another breakout season. Had a really good year this year, easily his best of his career, and they just threw the ball to him more. So I think overall, he'd be a really good option to pick up. He'll be decently cheap. I think, for instance, maybe a team like the Dolphins, if they lose Jarvis Landry, you pick up a Ryan Grant, he could be a really good option. So it, all in all, wouldn't be a terrible option for, for any team to pick up. Solid slot receiver. Ryan Grant checking in at number 14 in our rankings. Let's move along to number 13 now. Eric Decker, wide receiver of the Titans. Or excuse me, we are checking that. This is actually Kendall Wright. That is my mistake. I'm reading my script wrong. I probably should check my vision. Wright is number 13, Harris. Wide receiver for the Bears and a team with obviously a lot of need at that position. I wonder if they bring him back. I got I had a t I just a little story because we don't need to spend too much time on Kendall Wright. I had a friend uh, who was a Titans fan. And when the Bears signed Kendall Wright, he sent me a text just with about 50 ha-has because he's like, Kendall Wright is horrible. Kendall Wright is total, total trash. He was never good. This and that. He was all getting up my stuff, and he did not have a great year. I think that he is incredibly limited as an overall wide receiver. I think that if you get him, you have to know you're getting a guy who is a straight-up bust of a first-round pick. So, look, if you have Titans fans who are laughing at him because he was a former first-round pick, that should tell you all you need to know. Well, you know, the guy was never good at catching touchdowns. He had one touchdown this year, struggled his entire career in the red zone. So, it, you know, again, buyer beware with Kendall Wright. He's not going to live up to your expectations. I would not be shocked to see Kendall Wright walk and maybe the Chicago Bears look elsewhere for wide receivers and free agency and perhaps the draft as well. So Kendall Wright's at number 13. Now we have one Eric Decker. And, well, Decker essentially kind of was absent playing for the Tennessee Titans last year. He was pretty popular in fantasy football circles. Pretty popular in terms of, you know, just red zone efficiency and things like that. And, you know, he did deal with a couple of injuries here and there. We didn't really see much of him last year. I think he could still end up being a really solid wide receiver. For, for any team that just needs maybe a number three receiver, maybe a vet on the outside to help nurture some younger guys, he's just, you know, again, that's two years in a row now for him where he struggled. Obviously, in 2016, he was dealing with injuries. But, look, his social media game is better than his actual football game at this point. He's a good wide receiver, but... I think anyone who picks him up, maybe the Ravens, you know, is a number three option, maybe yeah. in the red zone to try to get some jump balls in there. We talked about him in the office with the Saints, but Decker's good. He's a solid wide receiver, but, you know, I think his best years are behind him. All right, so you have some of the teams there, the Titans, Ravens, Raiders, and Saints, all perhaps looking into Eric Decker. Speaking of the Ravens, we've got one Mike Wallace oh God, checking Mike in Wallace. at number 11. And the Baltimore Ravens need a lot of help at the wide receiver position. And Mike Wallace, look, he had 52 receptions, 748 yards. Not a really bad stat line, but, you know, some fluky plays in 2017 for him. Don't believe in those numbers too much. I am I I might be Mike Wallace's like lowest fan. I, I don't really see what he brings to an offense besides the ability to run straight. I get it. He gets a lot of receiving yards just because, again, he can run straight faster than a lot of other people. And some offenses need that. But, look, he's turning 32 this year. He had, he had a good year at the Ravens this year. But, look, at, at this point, I'll put it this way. Who would you rather have, Mike Wallace or Ted Ginn? Ted Ginn. Yeah, exactly. And so at that point, you have a wide receiver who runs straight who's worse than Ted Ginn. It's just that that's the level of wide receiver you're getting. I'm, I've never been crazy about Mike Wallace. I think he's massively overrated. So that's why he's there at number 11 and certainly not at number three or number two or anything like that. Yeah, the so. fact that he had 1,000 yards last year was a total fluke. The Ravens had nobody else to throw to on that entire football Well, in 2016, team. yes, yeah. over 1,000 no yards. Thanks. 2017 around 748 yards so no. there's Mike Wallace at number 11 let's get to number 10 now and Taylor Gabriel wide receiver for the Falcons 
The Falcons kind of have a need at wideout outside of Julio Jones, so it would be smart for them to bring him back. Look, he had a really good year in 2016 and then just got totally underused this year for the Atlanta Falcons, but you could probably say that about every single possible person on the Atlanta Falcons offense. He was underused. Julio Jones was underused. Devonta Freeman was underused. Mohamed Sanu was underused. Like, all these dudes, just because the offense is, in general, just massively underachieved. And I think Taylor Gabriel was hurt by that a lot. He had a really good year in 2016, being able to stretch the field. He brought a lot of versatility to that offense. Only had one touchdown this year to six the year before. So, I think Taylor Gabriel should leave, if, at least since they're keeping Steve Sarkeesian. I think he can end up being a really, really good option. I like us having the Bears on there because I think they could use his speed really, really well to stretch the field. Maybe draft a Calvin Ridley as well to open up things underneath for, uh, underneath for him. So Taylor Gabriel, solid option, tremendously underused this year for the Falcons, just like he was on the Browns the first couple years in his career. Taylor Gabriel, number 10 in our top 15 free agent wide receiver rankings. Let's take a look at number nine now, Jordan Matthews and you really want to try so, so hard to say this guy can be a number one wide receiver, but Harris, he just can't take over a game. Man, he can't the, stay healthy. The enigma continues for Jordan Matthews. Everyone's just waiting and waiting and waiting for him to become like the super wide receiver people thought he was. I mean, for crying out loud, he's Jerry Rice's nephew. You'd think at this point he'd be able to put it together. But I, look, the, the Philadelphia Eagles were going into the year and they knew they had a talented roster and they dumped him. He was the wide receiver they ended up trading to the Bills. They kept Nelson Aguilar coming off one of the worst seasons we've seen from a, a first-round pick Showing wide receiver in a long in time. Him, yeah. And he rewarded them. Aguilar was fantastic. Jordan Matthews goes to the Bills, couldn't stay on the field. He's still not effective in the red zone. He still chop, drops too many balls. I, I, I think at this point we kind of know who he is, and it's a shame because I was really high on him coming out of college. I thought he was going to be absolutely fantastic, and he just hasn't been able to put it together. I mean, when you see 6'3", 205, but still runs a 446. I mean, I'm signing up for that, right? You know, it's just... I, I, I'm sorry, Cam, and I don't mean to say this. He's like the quintessential Ravens wide receiver. Uh, that's fair. That's very I, fair. Th and honestly, I think that might be where he ends up. Oh, God, please, no. Uh, Jordan Matthews is at number nine. Let's take a look at number eight now. Dante Moncrief. And here's a name where we thought one day would just pop out into the headlines making big time plays and we haven't really well, seen that from him. I, I think he has the ability, but I think if there's any wide receiver in the NFL who was hurt more by their quarterback going down, it was Dante Moncrief. Because when, when Andrew Luck was actually healthy and throwing in the ball, he was really good in 2015, had a half of a breakout season, you know, it's 64 catches for 733 yards and six touchdowns. He's making great catches in primetime football. And then the past two seasons, you know, Andrew Luck goes away, and as does Dante Moncrief's production. You know, you just it, it's a shame because I think the talent is there. It's just like Devontae Adams. I think that Devontae Adams has done a, had a much better NFL career because he's had Aaron Rodgers. If you put Dante Moncrief on a team with a good quarterback, I think he's going to succeed. I think, us having the four, I think having the 49ers on there is a great fit. I think he'd be perfect for Jimmy Garoppolo on the outside, but... Again, he's got to go to a team with a good quarterback. You, you, you throw him out there with, with a Jacoby Brissett or, you know, whoever the heck the Colts have been throwing out there at quarterback for the past two seasons, this is the production you're going to get from him. You know what the sad thing is? Moncrief missed the Curtis Painter era. Oh, darn. <laughs> in, in oh, Curtis Painter. La, la, la. I don't <laughs> even want to hear that name. Moncrief checking in at number eight. Let's take a look at number seven. This guy is a speedster. John Brown, wide receiver for the Cardinals. And, look, I think this guy has so much potential. Just haven't seen it on the field quite yet, at least consistently. Yeah, and, and, and it's tough because I think that that's kind of every Arizona Cardinals wide receiver. You know, they have John Brown, they have, you know, Jerron Brown, and then they also have J.J. Nelson. And all three of them kind of do the same thing, and they all eat into each other's production. But if you smush all three of those guys together, you actually have a good overall wide receiver. Mm -hmm. I, John Brown is another kind of enigma for me because one day he'll look really, really good and be able to stretch the field. You know, you go back to his numbers in 2015, 1,000 yards and seven touchdowns, and ever since then he's just it, his production's just been on the straight decline. Only played 10 games this year, but still decently young, only 27 years old. I, I'm like you. I think that if he's put in the right offense, he can be really good. The Dallas Cowboys being on this list scream, just screams perfect fit to me. They need someone like him who can really stretch the field and also actually hold on to the ball. He's kind of a better version of Bryce Butler. So 
I, I would like to see what John Brown can do in an offense where he actually has a legitimate role and he isn't just being tossed around between three other guys who can do the same thing he can. And you see that sickle cell trait uh, note there on your screen, folks. Yep. And obviously that's a tough situation to deal with and really kind of hurts your immune system and can kind of, you know, yep. hurt you in many different ways. And so that's probably why he's missed many games throughout his career. And I do think he does have the potentiality to be a high-end wide receiver two, low-end wide receiver one, but we shall see. There is John Brown at number seven. Let's take a look at number six now. Danny Amendola, wide receiver for the Patriots. Wonder if this guy walks, Harris. Uh, I can tell you right now, he ain't going anywhere. Okay. After what he's been able to do the past three years, and also this proves, you know, fan opinions over players can be switched over time. And I remember when they first signed Danny Amendola after Wes Walker left. Outrage, absolute outrage among Patriots fans that they brought him in. But ever since, he's become, you know, a legend. He's now folklore. They sing songs about Danny Amendola. Danny Playoff Amendola, he's been given a nickname. He ain't going anywhere. They've been restructuring his contract every single year for the past three years. He's said that he wants to retire as a Patriot. I think he'll end up staying. Brady trusts him. If you watch Tom versus Time, he brings him to, to Costa Rica and Puerto Rico and Montana and California. Wherever Tom Brady goes, Danny Amendola is there practicing with him. He has a ton of trust in him. I, I think Danny Amendola will be back with the Patriots, and he'll be back as a bargain as well. The production that he's been able to put up during the season, and, and again, I think all NFL fans can just we're in awe by how incredible this guy has been on third down. One of the highest third down catch percentages in the NFL. So Danny Amendola is probably going to go back to the Patriots. But if he does end up leaving, man, a team is going to get a steal of a wide receiver. Well, you talk about third down conversion, something the Ravens really struggled yeah. with last year. So Joe Flacco hey, would certainly they, love They already took Amendola. Danny Amendola. So that would be the second white guy they've taken from the Patriots in the past like three years. Wait, who are you talking about? Danny Woodhead. Oh, I already said oh, Woodhead. Of Woodhead, my bad. Yes, Two yes. Dannys, I'm sorry. All right, so there's Danny Amendola at number six. Let's get to the top five now for free agent wide receivers, Paul Richardson, of the Seattle Seahawks, I think he's going to get some looks. He is going to get some looks, but again, I would just Paul Enigma Richardson. Like he one day he's making crazy, unbelievable catches versus the Lions in the playoffs, and then you put him in the regular season, he still doesn't really have the production that you're waiting for. He's so thin, but. I'm just waiting for Paul Richardson to break out and have this crazy 1,100-yard season with eight touchdowns. And he had a good season this year, 44 catches for 700 yards and six TDs. He, he is a good vertical threat on offense, but at the same time, you just, you're just you waiting for him to explode. And I think that he needs to stay in Seattle in order to reach his potential. I think he's on the perfect team where he can kind of roam around while Russell Wilson's working outside of the pocket and find open spots in the defense. I think that's where Paul Richardson fits the best. I think the Packers would also be a good option for him. We know that Aaron Rodgers loves to make plays outside the pocket. So Paul Richardson needs to be in a little bit more wild of an offense. I think the more structure there is, the worse he's going to be. So Seattle, Green Bay, we have Carolina listed as well. Mm. So Paul Richardson is going to be a good option, uh, but I think he ends up staying with Seattle. You see a common theme with the Bears, by the way. Yeah. They need a wide receiver. Every single wide receiver should be linked to the Bears. Yeah, so there's Paul Richardson at number five. Let's go to number four now, Marquise Lee. Wide receiver for the Jaguars. We'll get to another Jags wide receiver later, but what do we make of Lee? Marquise Lee, for me, is the wide receiver who all throughout college and all throughout the NFL should have been way better than he's always ended up being. He's just he's just never exploded onto the scene. He has had a good couple of years here and there. He's a solid number two, number three receiver, but he's just never really turned into anything more. I think we've seen what he is as an NFL wide receiver. He's a Decent number two, a high-end number three. He's not a number one. He doesn't have the size. He doesn't have the speed. He doesn't have one incredible skill that just pops off the page. He so, somewhat stepped up after Robinson got hurt. Kind of. Like, but only somewhat. Not enough that they needed him to. They needed him to turn into kind of a star, and he just, he he just has it. He's a great complement to a better wide receiver. He is a great number two to an Allen Robinson or to a Sammy Watkins or even to a DeAndre Hopkins, but he is not a suitable number one. I think he needs to go to a team that already has a number one wide receiver. 
I, I think he ends up staying in Jacksonville. It would be a nice compliment to the 49ers wide receiver core. You have Pierre Garcon, Marquise Goodwin. You insert Marquise Leah as well, and maybe things would work out in the Bay Area. But I, I think he could be a solid option there. But again, I think you know he could be a good Mohamed Sanu to someone's Julio yep. Jones is kind of what I comp him to. All right, so there's Marquise Lee at number four. Let's get to the top three. Sammy Watkins, wide receiver oh, Sammy. for the Rams. And we'll ask a question to the folks watching the program in a matter of moments, but I'll let you say your thing, Harris. Sammy Watkins. Look, I'll say this about Sammy Watkins, okay? We all, you know, he gets traded to one of the highest, you know, production producing offenses in the entire NFL. He plays 15 games this year with Jared Goff. You know, every one of the offense is going crazy. 39 catches, under 600 yards, good touchdown number of eight, but only 39 catches in that offense? And he's supposed to be, you know, this crazy number one wide receiver with all this talent and stuff. I, I'm still waiting for him to get good. I know that he's had flashes, a lot of flashes. He showed a ton of flashes in Buffalo, but he can just never stay on the field. It can never be consistent with it. never really comes together. He looked lazy at times this year with the Los Angeles Rams. So, look, I, I, I put a buyer beware tag on Sammy Watkins because you never know when he's going to get hurt. You never know when he's going to throw out a little laziness out there. There is no excuse for him this year. I get it. New offense, whatever. But you would expect his production to improve down the stretch. It, it just hasn't. It just didn't work out this year for, the, for him and the Los Angeles Rams. I, I think overall, it, 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 maybe he needs to go to a different team. I think he's expendable to the Rams. I, I agree. He just, Robert, I'll put it this way. Who, is, who has more talent, Sammy Watkins or Robert Woods? Talent? Probably Sammy Watkins, right? Yes. Robert Woods completely outproduced him, absolutely smoked him. I, I, I still don't understand. I don't get where – I don't get Sammy Watkins. One of the biggest enigmas of a wide receiver in the NFL. I, color me cautious, I wouldn't take him. Well, he was the uh, number four overall pick in the 2014 draft, and when you pick a guy that high, you expect him to be your franchise. The Bills obviously didn't feel that way. We'll see what Sammy can do in the open market if he does indeed walk. So there he is at number three in our wide receiver rankings. I teased another Jacksonville Jaguars wide receiver. It is one Allen Robinson. He's been tied to many different teams out there, but here's the deal, Harris. I think the Jaguars have to put the best possible offense around Blake Bortles, and that includes Allen Robinson. I am a total buyer of Allen Robinson. And look, in 2016, his last full season, obviously he missed this last one with the torn ACL, under 1,000 yards and six touchdowns. But the year before that, 80 catches, 1,400 yards on the nose, and 14 touchdowns. You don't just randomly put up those numbers and not be good. And he had a good year in 2016, but his yards after the catch were not nearly as good. So I think overall, he, he is growing as an NFL wide receiver. I think him missing this year was such a shame. Imagine what that Jacksonville Jaguars offense could have been, especially with him in the play action. You add, uh, add Leonard Fournette in there as well. So, look, I like Allen Robinson a lot. I think he's a really solid wide receiver. I would be surprised if he leaves Jacksonville. I think he likes it there. I think the culture really fits his personality as well. But I would love to see what happens if he goes to San Francisco with Jimmy Garoppolo. I think that would be an absolute coup for the 49ers if they were able to steal him away. Don't be surprised if they throw a ton of money at him so far. They had $100 million in cap space or something crazy before they signed Jimmy Garoppolo. Don't be surprised if they throw a nice chunk of chains at Robinson this offseason. Hey, Robinson's not going to be cheap if the Jaguars do decide to give him the franchise tag. will be around $16 million. So we'll see what happens there. So we will stay in the Sunshine State now because we have one more wide receiver to get to. It's one Jarvis Landry and negotiations with Miami leadership in Landry have not gone well. And I think it's likely this guy goes ahead and sees what he can do in the free agent market. I am still so confused by him. Look, he catches everything. He has great hands, 400 receptions in his first, I believe, yeah, four years in the NFL. He's been fantastic. But how do you catch 112 passes and not get over 1,000 yards? I get it. I understand that the way they use him on offense, but Cam, he caught 112 balls. How do you not break 1,000 yards? It's just, that, that's wild to me. I think he's a really good wide receiver. I think he's going to go somewhere else and be even better, but He's just a weird wide receiver. He didn't have great touchdown numbers until he got nine, uh, nine uh, touchdowns this year. He had 1,000 yards the past two years, but caught 112 balls and didn't break it this year. 
He has been a really weird wide receiver in the NFL for the past couple of years with the Dolphins. I think he goes elsewhere and has a better career. I think the Bears would be a great slot for him. Again, I think the 49ers would be a great slot for him. If the Patriots decide to move on from Danny Amendola, I think the Patriots would be a good option for him. I think he's going to get paid this offseason. You don't just wake up and get 400 catches for 4,000 yards and 22 touchdowns in your first four years in the NFL. I, I do believe, in my, if my memory serves me correctly, 400 catches in his first four years in the NFL ranks top five all time. So Jarvis Landry, one of the better slot wide receivers in the NFL, I, I think he's going to have a great career elsewhere from Miami. Well, Constantine, watching the show right now, says he's the best slot receiver in the league. And look, he's going to get big-time yep. money despite just being a slot receiver. I think there's going to be a lot of value for him out there. Folks, throw in your respective votes in the reaction poll. 49ers, Bears, Ravens, or Cowboys for Jarvis Landry. Let's summarize our list. 15 through 11, Terrell Pryor, Ryan Grant, Kendall Wright, Eric Decker, Mike Wallace. 10 through 6, Taylor Gabriel, Jordan Matthews, Dante Moncrief, John Brown, and Danny Amendola. And then the top five. Paul Richardson, Marquise Lee, Sammy Watkins, Allen Robinson, and Jarvis Landry. This is NFL Daily presented by the Game Time app. Get up to 60% off all of those last-minute sports tickets, oh, yeah. concert tickets, and theater tickets. Chatsports.com slash tickets is indeed the website to download. Really fantastic app. Yeah, man. Just Five stars. Download the Game Time app. Maybe you have the Chat Sports one as well. You put them together. It's the perfect combination. There you have you all your sports news and scores you need. And whenever you want to go to a sporting event, you have the Game Time app. It's perfect. All right. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We ranked the free agent offensive linemen as well as free agent wide receivers. Let's get to the tight ends now. And we will start things off. With number 10 in our rankings, it's one Luke Wilson of the <laughs> Seattle Seahawks. A, a Colt fan favorite on Seahawks Reddit is Luke Wilson. <laughs> uh, they, they, they love this guy, and he's a solid wide receiver, or excuse me, solid tight end uh, all around. Good blocker. You know, he's been a backup behind Jimmy Graham for a while, so he mostly blocks, but they use him in the red zone pretty effectively. I think that's what he, that's what he kind of is in the NFL. He's a, he's a backup tight end. I, I expect he stays in Seattle, but... If you're looking to get someone who can block, maybe do a little stuff for you around the red zone, Luke Wilson's your guy. And uh, you know, a shout out to uh, Amina Kimes, who's actually Luke Wilson's biggest fan on Twitter. So, look, he's just a good, solid wide receiver. He's had a fun career in the NFL. Luke Wilson, our number 10 guy, as you see, the Jets, the Colts, the Dolphins could also be interested, as well as the Seattle Seahawks. All right, let's take a look at number nine in our rankings, ladies and gentlemen, Richard Rodgers and. It's just eh. So we're at this point in the rankings where it's just eh, and we'll eventually get to the really big time names. But Richard Rodgers of the Packers here. Did uh did Aaron Rodgers play this year? Somewhat. Nah, eh, just a little bit. That's why Richard Rodgers was bad. If you look at his stats when Aaron Rodgers is playing and when he's not, it is laughable how much worse he gets when Aaron Rodgers isn't playing. Another career that he's been able to make. I, he's going to leave for me. He kind of screams Arizona Cardinal. I, I just, <laughs> I, he does. I, I think he's going to end up going somewhere and just kind of being a backup tight end. I mean, you know, they signed Jermaine Gresham the, those years ago, and he's still there. The tight end position for the Cardinals kind of been just a whole lot of meh. And Richard Rodgers, an overall NFL wide receiver, just, just kind of meh. Richard Rodgers checking in at number nine in our tight end rankings. Number Eight now, Ed Dixon, oh, tight end Ed of the Dixon. Panthers. I know him well from his days in Baltimore, and the Ravens are perhaps a team likely interested in him, but Ed Dixon is just eh. He's just, he's just always around. He you is. know, he's blocking. He'll make a couple crazy catches. You know, he'll have like one game a year where he goes off, and you'll have a couple fantasy people saying, bye, Ed Dixon. You know, it's, it's Ed Dixon. He's, he's a decent backup tight end. He's a better blocker than he is a receiver. 30 years old. He's consistent. He's a good locker room guy. But at the end of the day, it, like, it's Ed Dixon. You know what you're getting with him. I think a return to the Ravens would actually be quite fitting. Third I round think it'd pick be fun. Yeah. Out of Oregon there. Way back the Ravens. All right, so there's Ed Dixon at number eight in our rankings. Let's take a look at number seven now. And this is one Ben Watson, the grizzled veteran. Bumping Harris. Benny Watson. Oh, I love Ben Watson. One of he my favorite. Oh, he's last great. Year. He's just, he just keeps on ticking. Ben Watson is going to end up going. Like, we're going to look back on like a lot of these crazy old NFL teams, you know, like you do now. And just like, wow, Ben Watson played until he was blank and blank old. He's 37 years old. The dude was drafted way back in, I, I want to say, I think 2004 to the New England Patriots. Look, 
Ben Watson has just been one of the more consistent uh, tight ends in the NFL. He's played for a bunch of different teams. It was great to see him have such a good comeback season off that torn Achilles. I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up going back to the Patriots. They're going to cut Dwayne Allen, you know, Gronk with all these retirement rumors. He's, <laughs> he's probably going to replace Martellus Bennett. Like, Ben Watson's going to be a good, solid pickup for any team. I would expect him to go to a team that has a Super Bowl uh, winning potential. I don't think he's going to go to one of your lower-end teams. One of the great guys in the NFL Absolutely. as well. So one of the uh, Men of the Year nominees, Ben Watson. Fantastic season for the Ravens, all things considered, especially with that passing attack that wasn't very good. Also a great guy, by yeah. the way. Been uh, constantly in the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award uh, talks. One, one of the best community guys in the NFL. I did just mention that. Oh, you know, I'm sorry. Okay, that's all good, buddy. Hey, Ben Watson at number seven. Oh, Let's take a look at number six now. Virgil Green, tight end for the Denver Broncos. I, I got distracted because I learned today that Virgil Green is 30 years old. When did Virgil Green become 30 years old? I thought he got drafted in the NFL like three years ago. Nope, he's 30. He's been in the NFL forever just blocking. He is a blocking tight end. Do you need someone to block on offense? Sign Virgil Green. That, that's kind of where his career is. I remember when, um, when Julius Thomas left the Broncos, there were all these you know, fantasy articles. Oh, pick up Virgil Green. He's going to be the next tight end for the Broncos. And just, nope, totally just did not happen. So either. we know who he is at this yeah, point. Yeah, he's a blocker. You know, 14 catches for under 200 yards and a touchdown this year. He blocks. Yeah. That's all he needs to be. He, he blocks. Like, you know, he could go to the Jaguars behind Mercedes Lewis and block. You can go to the Jets behind Austin Severian Jenkins and block. Like, that's what Virgil Green does. He blocks. All right, so he's there at number six. Let's go to number five and a future Hall of Famer, Antonio Gates. You got to wonder when this guy's going to call it a career, but it's pretty safe to say he's going to stay with the Chargers. Though the, the, uh, the NFL cyborg, I'm pretty sure at this point, both of his legs are, robo are robotic. Yeah. Like, he's just this. I, I love Antonio Automatic. Gates. One of the greatest tight ends in NFL history. Probably a first ballot Hall of Famer. To, you know, maybe you will see, but just, just you know, it's Antonio Gates. Did you know that he played basketball in college? I don't know. They don't mention that enough in NFL broadcasts. Exactly. That Antonio Gates played, uh, you know, basketball in college. So did Jimmy Graham, by the way. So I love Antonio Gates. It's it's nice to see that he's still playing. He's still kicking. I, I mean, it's, he probably should have retired like three years ago. But hey, you keep making that money, Antonio Gates. Keep keep bringing in those dollars. So there he is at number five. You mentioned Austin Safarian Jenkins. Oh, he is SJ. indeed a free agent. And I think, look, he's at number four here on our list. Kind of had a little bit of a resurgence last year. 50 receptions. It's not too he bad. He started off really, really hot and then totally just vanished down the stretch. I, I, he's still a massive enigma to me. Or a, a puzzle. I keep using the word enigma. He's a puzzle. I, I like Austin Safarian Jenkins. He will forever go down this season as the guy who got totally screwed over in that Patriots-Jets game by fumbling the ball out of bounds. That mm. probably wasn't a fumble, whatever you want to say. Got totally annihilated by that call, and his season wasn't the same afterwards. I think he's a good, solid pickup for anyone that needs a number two tight end, especially someone that just needs to catch balls. He got 50, catch, uh, 50 balls this year for the Jets. His production totally went away once Josh McCown went down. So, Which is understandable. It is understandable. I, I think he'll be a good pickup for any team looking for a tight end that's going to be relatively cheap. All right, so let's go into number three now, Trey Burton, tight end for the Philadelphia Eagles. An interesting name. Yeah. A uh, highly versatile player, can play tight end, can also play wide receiver. He's a backup for the Eagles this year. You know, if he had five touchdowns, good red zone target, and hey, if you need him to, he can also throw a touchdown in the Super Bowl when you need him most. Former quarterback, look, solid player. Uh, I wouldn't say, you know, the, the last great tight end that's come out of being a backup was uh, what was Martellus Bennett way back when. So we'll end up seeing what Trey Burton can do. I like him a lot. I think he'll end up being a decent pickup for an NFL uh, for a roster. I think the Jaguars would actually end up being really cool. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what he can do as a number one tight end. So there mm -hmm. is Trey Burton at number three. Number two, Tyler Eifert, a guy that just can't stay on the football field. He's such a talented player. We've seen it before. But four receptions, 46 yards in 2017, that's all you need to see. Yeah, just look, he's missed 41 games in his career. It's unbelievable. 41 games. And, and just it kind of goes back to the fact that like drafting tight ends high is so unbelievably risky. When he plays, he's good, but he's just injured all the time. He was supposed to get a massive, massive, massive contract. Franchise from, kind of yeah, contract. From the Bengals, and 
just got injured again this year. So buyer beware. Buy at your own risk. I, I, don't tr I trust him as far as I can throw him. But at the same time, I think he would make an outstanding Green Bay Packer. I think you slot him in with Aaron Rodgers, finally gets that tight end that he needs, maybe even the Texans with Deshaun Watson. I don't think he ends up staying with the Bengals. I think he ends up getting a decent contract from another team, maybe three years, 18, three years, 20, maybe. I, I think he'd be a good option for a team trying to get better at the tight end position like the Packers. You know what? I think he'd be a nice little compliment, too, to Jack Doyle and the Indianapolis yeah, I like that out as there, well. too. So we'll see what happens with Tyler Eifert at number two, which probably means you know who's at number one. It's Jimmy Graham. Yes, you heard it right. And we're wondering, could there be a New Orleans Saints reunion? There they That would are. be fun. I think the Texans are actually a fantastic fit, for, especially for what they need at the tight end position. They just need more guys around the red zone that can catch touchdowns that aren't named DeAndre Hopkins. I think Jimmy Graham would be a fantastic fit for them. You slot him with Deshaun Watson, use the play action with Lamar Miller. He'd be a great fit, but the, the real question is what ends up happening? Does he go to the Saints? Does he, go to the, does he stay with the Seahawks? I, I, I question what ends up happening to Jimmy Graham, and I also question if he's actually a tight end. Just sign him as a wide receiver. That's exactly I don't think right. he's a tight end. Which leads us to this. For all of you people watching the show, is Jimmy Graham really a tight end or just a wide receiver? He's a wide, he can't block. Remember the years ago when he was arguing for wide receiver kind of money? Oh, I remember that. And to be totally honest, I, I think he deserved it. I think that's what he is. He's not a tight end. He's a wide receiver. All those Gronk versus Jimmy Graham things, they play two different positions. I understand that Jimmy Graham comes off the line and is absolutely massive, but that doesn't mean that he's a, a, a tight end. He doesn't block. He's one of the worst blocking tight ends whenever he's asked to do it. Let him play wide receiver. Put him on the outside. He's great in the red zone. Just He might be one of the only wide receivers in the NFL, tight ends, excuse me, who can actually catch an end zone fade on a consistent basis. I, I think Jimmy Graham should leave. I'd like to see what he can do in, in Houston. All right, so certainly a big-time jump from number 10 to number 1 in our tight end rankings. Let's take a look at the first set of five here. Luke Wilson, Richard Rodgers, Ed Dixon, Ben Watson, and Virgil Green, followed by Antonio Gates, Austin Safarian Jenkins, Trey Burton, Tyler Eifert, and Jimmy Graham there. This is NFL Daily, folks, presented by the Game Time app. Head on to chatsports.com slash tickets to learn more, getting up to 60% off all those last-minute sports tickets, concert tickets, and so much more. So it's the Chat Sports app on one side, it's the Game Time app on the other. Really a fantastic product at that. Five-star reviews across the board for Game Time. So let's slide along here on the program. We're wrapping up the show with the latest news and rumors across the National Football League. And we'll start off with note number one. Are Emmanuel Sanders and Demarius Thomas safe from being cut by the Denver Broncos? We're giving this two Goodell heads here. So people are talking about this one, Harris. People are talking. I think the reason that they are talking, I think they have one more year with this wide receiver combo, simply because if you bring in a, a quarterback like Kirk Cousins and add him to this offense with Emmanuel Sanders and Demarius Thomas, you got to make a run in the Super Bowl. And if, if they don't make it, then they end up cutting one of these guys. But Look, you know, I think if you've added a good quarterback to this Broncos team, you end up with a Super Bowl caliber roster. And it's because they have Emmanuel Sanders and Marius Thomas. I think they keep him for one more year. So Ian Rapp Rappaport saying the belief is that both stay on the team. And if the Broncos keep both these players, it's more likely than not that they're going to have to cut either Akeem Tlaib, Chris Harris Jr., etc. Because they can't keep all of exactly. their corners. I think Akeem Tlaib, if they keep one of the wide receivers, will end up being the guy on the chopping block. You see the two Goodell heads at the bottom of your screen. So that is a no. scale of believability. So let's take a look at the ratings, if you will. So no Goodell heads, it means it's fake news. One Goodell head, a small shred of truth. Two Goodell heads, as you just saw. People are talking, something swirling here. Three Goodell heads, more probable than not. And four Goodell heads... Fact, news, it's news, it's 100%, it's happening, all that good stuff. So, let's get into news and rumor number two. Are the Raiders moving on from veteran Sebastian Janikowski, Harris? Looks like the 18-year run is over. We're giving it for Goodell. Hicks. Yeah, it's sad. It got reported right before we went on air. You know, they go from Sebastian Janikowski to Giorgio Tavecchio. So, I don't know if you could go from one great kicker name to another great kicker name better than what the Oakland Raiders just did. 
you know, it's sad to see. It's the end of an era. It's Seabash. It's the Polis Cannon, one of the best kickers, at least in my opinion, in NFL history. Certainly one of the most iconic. I hope he gets picked up. I love Sebastian Janikowski. He was one of he was my fantasy kicker for like five straight years. I love Seabass. You know what's funny? He was kicking in that tuck rule game, the snow game He's against the Patriots. He's been around forever. He's been know, around for a long time. Such a shame to see a franchise give up on a first round kicker this early. Such a shame. All right, so we're giving that one four Goodell heads. As you see, Adam Schefter is reporting that. Let's get to number three now. Johnny Manziel, is he joining the Spring League this year? Yes, he is. It came right from the source himself. Johnny Manziel for Goodell heads, Harris. Ah, good for Johnny Manziel. I'm kind of excited to see him watch football, but I'll say the same. I'm in this, I have a weird relationship with Johnny Manziel. I'm, in, I'm 50-50 between not caring at all and being really excited for him to come back. I don't really know what to think yet. Ah, good for Johnny Manziel and playing football again. I'm happy to see he's trying to turn his life around, but, you know, he's still kind of not a great person. So I'll, I'm, I'm waiting okay. to see him. All right, so that GMA interview back on Monday didn't really Look, improve I, I, things in knew, terms of your we opinion. We knew that he had problems. I am happy he's not drinking yet or not drinking anymore. Waiting to, waiting to be seen what happens with Johnny Manziel. Oh, we're already seeing uh, some comments flowing in. <laughs> Dallas Cowboys fans are like, we don't want Johnny Manziel yeah, in Dallas. I remember that whole that whole craziness that the Cowboys are going to trade up for Johnny Manziel. Yeah, thank God that didn't happen. So will Johnny Manziel play in the NFL again? Ladies and gentlemen, throw in your votes, and we will move along now to news and rumor number four. Mike Glennon, is he set to be cut by the Chicago Bears, and we're giving this three Goodell heads more probable than not. Why would you leave this guy on the team? He has the biggest cap number on the Bears with $16 it, million. it is almost as if the Bears signed him to only play one year and then get cut. Oh, wait, that's exactly what they planned on doing. He's, this is how this contract was supposed to work out. He wasn't supposed to make it into year two. He signed the one-year deal to start, get paid a ton of money one year, and then just get cut after for years two and three. He is a, a $16 million cap cut. Goodbye. All right, so three Goodell heads for that one. And let's check in with news and rumor number five here as we have a few minutes left on the program. Oh, Are I the Broncos going to make a run at A.G. Oh, McCarron? Oh, boy. They can't yet, Harris. The NFL has to decide if McCarron is a restricted free agent uh, or an unrestricted free agent. But we are giving this to Goodell heads. I can't wait for A.J. McCarron to start for an NFL team and for people to not necessarily be reminded, just be convinced that he is not a good NFL quarterback. <laughs> I, I was so bummed that the Browns didn't end up getting him because he is the most Cleveland Browns quarterback to have ever maybe come into the NFL. Please go to the Cleveland Browns. Please, 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 because A.J. McCarron going to any NFL team and starting is hilarious to me. I don't know, Harris. I think he could be a quality starter. I don't. <laughs> Give him a full sample I think size. He's, I think he's Kirk Cousins, but like 25% worse, Okay. which right. is not a good NFL quarterback. So there's news and rumor number five. Let's go into number six now. Is Drew Brees leaving the New Orleans Saints? We are giving this one Goodell head, ladies and gentlemen, a small shred of truth. So the New Orleans Times Pucan said that uh, there's a possibility that Brees could look elsewhere here. Low key, I think the New Orleans Saints are one of the worst money managed teams in the entire NFL. They have been cap strapped for what seems like my entire NFL analyst career. Every single year, it's, oh, the Saints have cap problems. Oh, the Saints have cap problems. Saints have cap problems. And then they go out and give Jarius Bird a ridiculous contract that they're still paying out because they don't know how to run the NFL cap. There, it's so bad that there's rumors that Drew Brees, the guy who basically, re no, not basically, reinvented the entire Saints franchise, isn't going to get a contract from them. Are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. This has been going on for years. Stop playing hardball with Drew Brees and pay the man. Stop it. Folks, throw in your votes. Is there any chance Brees plays for another team? Give us a heart for he's forever a saint or a like. There is a chance he may move on. Harris, I will note, back in 2012, he was growing pretty frustrated with contract negotiations Yeah, because they're the Saints. stupid. He's, he's incredible. He's 38 years old. He's still one of five to ten best quarterbacks in football, and they're playing hardball with him. Come on. Where are you without Drew Brees? All right, folks, that wraps up our news and rumor segment. 
And we're wrapping up the entire program. Cam Rogers alongside Harris Rubenstein. Many thanks to Game Time for sponsoring today's show. One more time, it's chatsports.com slash tickets to download and get up to 60% off all those last minute sports tickets and so much more. Harris Rubenstein, happy Valentine's Day, my friend. Happy Valentine's you Day to you out there. Say I love you to somebody tonight. That is your homework. Thanks so much for tuning <laughs> into the program. One more time, for Harris Rubenstein, I'm Cam Rogers. Peace out.